Thank you. First, just, uh, thank you. Yes, my mother was uh, so glad that I went on to get that GED and later uh, go on to school. <laughs> um, however, she was concerned about me going on to be a doctor since she actually thought herbalism and midwife had a much more honorable history. Um, <laughs> It's staggering when you look at the millions of children that are on Ritalin. It's staggering when you look at the multiple, multiple millions of people who are on antidepressants. The millions of people who get bypass surgery as they eat their hamburgers all the way to the surgeon's office. It is staggering when one thinks that the tobacco companies um, are now advertising their good deeds uh, as part of their settlement at the same time targeting Hispanic teenage women because their science and studies have shown that they're the group that smokes the least. It is staggering when you think of TB in Russia, but you don't have to go that far. You just have to go to the inner city. You have to go to the reservations of the United States to find it. Obesity used to be a disease of old age. Old people got type 2 diabetes. Now we see it in children 12, 13 years of age, especially amongst many Native American youth. Is this health care? Are we doing a good job? No. no. <laughs> I, I don't think so. And is the answer simply herbs? I would also argue is not either that if we simply use the German model, which I deeply respect but also have issues with, that we simply are replacing a drug with an herb, we have still missed the opportunity for true healing to take place. So I'd like to talk a little bit about some of the herbs and some of the things that we can do with them, but I'd like to keep in the back of your minds that if you reduce these plants to merely their constituents, synthesize them, reproduce them, and use them as drugs, you've not changed anything. Pharmaceutical, you, you've not. And I think that that's partly what American people are looking for, dietary supplements and botanicals right now. It's a multi-billion dollar industry, more than $14 billion. But instead of, of really getting to the root problems of our health, and, our, and, and, and promoting wellness, we're looking for things inside of a pill. And I think that's not, uh, that's not what the plants are here for. Plants are about, uh, they're seeds, and they grow, and they're about teaching us about life and death and the cycles of life and death. And if you took some of those children that were on Ritalin and put them in a garden and got them planting seeds and tending the soil and working on their own inner landscape, you might find that they would be just fine without their medication. <laughs> Pharmaceutical companies drive research in this country. Herbs are natural substances. They cannot be patented. There is no incentive for research right now to study these gentle beings. Nobody's going to pay for it. If you're a large company, why are you going to spend $200 million to study echinacea? when anybody could sell it at the health food store. Heck, you could grow it in your yard. So there is this misperception that these herbs have no value because they have not been researched. They have been researched, just not in this country. And we will not ever do research on them um, because of the way we drive medicine and what drives medicine now. For me, it's a good example about the inequity in the healthcare system when, and part of my problem with calling things complementary and alternative, because somehow they always remain outside, sort of the stepchild that's never brought in. Let me give you an example. You know, uh, and it raises the question, when is enough evidence enough? Well, I, I hear this litany all the time. You need more evidence, you need more evidence, you need more evidence. Okay, so fine, we bring all the evidence. And it's still not enough. Saw Palmetto, good example. If you're a man and you live long enough, you'll probably uh, get an enlarged prostate. That's just part of, part of what you guys get. We get menopause, PMS, and other things. You get a, a big prostate at some point. Well, we, say you come to see me and you're a 65-year-old gentleman and you have a limited income and your Medicare is through the HMO and you get what's on formulary. Well, you've got an enlarged prostate and pretty healthy guy. Your blood pressure is normal. What's on formulary for you for the treatment of your enlarged prostate is a blood pressure lowering medication. 
So we're going to give you an antihypertensive whose side effect is also to shrink or make your prostate so that you can urinate more freely. That's fine. I have to prescribe it to you at night so you don't get so dizzy that you fall down because your blood thirsters through the floor. You have to take it at night to prevent orthostatic hypotension. What if your blood pressure is normal? Why can't I prescribe you saw palmetto? Saw palmetto works. We've had a meta-analysis. It was in JAMA, the Bible of all Western medical research. We had a meta-analysis that says, guess what? It works. The United States Pharmacopeia, I chair the Dietary Supplements Botanicals Committee, it was the first herb that we actually gave a positive monograph to. Even the urologist said, gee, this stuff looks pretty good. <laughs> but you know what? You can get your antihypertensive for $2 copay at the pharmacy, but if you want saw palmetto, it's 30 bucks down at the health food store. It again comes down to inequity. At what point is it enough research? 28 trials, meta-analysis and JAMA, the United States Pharmacopeia saying it works, and yet it's still not covered because we still look at it as CAM and there is no pharmaceutical company lobbying for it to be covered. There's no pharmaceutical company giving you notepads and pens when you're a resident in medical school so that you know you see it all the time whenever you write a script. Saw Palmetto offers men a safe, appropriate, and effective treatment for a very common problem. When you're a 65 or 75-year-old gentleman, I don't want to give you something that lowers your blood pressure and increases your risk of falls because what? If you fall when you're 75 years of age and you break your hip, then we have even more trouble. Why? Why isn't saw palmetto covered? Glucosamine. Glucosamine. Been used for 20-some years in Europe. Works for arthritis. Arthritis, though it's not life-threatening, boy, it sure costs a lot of money to treat. I was shocked that I was never told in medical school that when you prescribe non-steroidal anti-inflammatories for arthritis that it actually prevents your body's ability to make new cartilage. It actually destroys it. So the longer you take it, the worse your arthritis gets. I'm sitting there thinking, now that would be important information to know. Now we've got, we've got glucosamine now that again has been systematically reviewed, 16 trials showing that it works, four trials showing that it works as well as the best non-steroidal that we have to offer, doesn't cause ulcers, doesn't cause renal failure, and a study published in The Lancet showed that it actually may reverse osteoarthritis by allowing your body to make more of its own connective tissue. We don't prescribe it. We don't learn about it. It's not paid for. It's not covered. Why? Why? Nobody's driving it. So I think one has to question, at what point do things become just medicine? At what point do we say that the best treatments that are safe and effective are available for people living here in the United States? And why should people that are economically disadvantaged not be entitled to use products that are often safer and just as efficacious because they're not covered by HMOs, Medicare, Medicaid? You know, we can't even get food stamps to cover multivitamins. I mean, what is that? Sorry, they told me if I, as long as I was a little unreasonable, I'd be okay. So this is kind of my natural state. But, but it just... It, It is disturbing that when you have people that have a hard time buying good food, that you won't even offer them the opportunity to get a multivitamin or an old person to get calcium and that that's not paid for. So I have issues with some of that. Um, more than a million children die every year around the world from diarrhea. Think about it. Think about that. That makes me so sad. And you know, I, I like looking at herbs that are simple and not comp... Well, they're all complex. They're very complicated. They're complex beings, actually. But I like garlic. Let me tell you just something about garlic. So the next time you eat it, you appreciate it and maybe give a little bit more thanks and gratitude for it. Garlic uh, has been primarily studied for its benefits in cholesterol, but its use 
for more than 25 centuries was actually as an antimicrobial. They used to call it Russian penicillin because it was so valued in poorer countries for its antibiotic activity. I don't use antibiotic. That's what most people are, are familiar with. I, I prefer antimicrobial, antibiotic meaning anti-life, antimicrobial properties. Albert Schweitzer said there was never a case of dysentery that he could not effectively treat with garlic. Louis Pasteur was the first one to really document its antiseptic properties. Japanese researchers have found that garlic, even heated to degrees that, uh, temperatures that exceed 100 degrees centigrade, it remains antimicrobial against E. coli 0157, the old jack-in-the-box food poisoning terrible stuff, remember? It is stable and extremely effective against it. It is also stable and effective against Salmonella, Vibrio cholera, Giardia, Entamoeba histolytica, major gut pathogens that cause terrible and often life-threatening diarrhea. Why not use garlic? Why not give garlic? Why not send garlic? And why not eat it? You know, when you go down into Mexico, when we went to Cuernavaca, there's a Spanish language school down there. And when the first day you get there, they put a little tray out and they say, OK, you start to get runny stools. Come in here, peel a couple of these, chop them up, chew them up, knead them. You'll be fine. It's because garlic works very well. Garlic also works very good for respiratory infections because all of those volatile oils are breathed in and up through the lungs. And they basically wash out all the pathogens that are inside of the respiratory tract, which is why they were always used for respiratory infections and for gut pathogens. Now let's look at it for its heart health. You know, everybody's going out and getting bypasses. My grandmother is in her 90s and was just recommended to have bypass surgery. And of course she said, no, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> my mother called and said, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm worried, maybe should I get it. Mom, she's in her 90s they will saw her chest with a saw. They will open up her, her chest. When it's all done, they'll stick her back together with bailing wire, basically, and stitch her back up like a turkey. I said, she's in her 90s. She will never recover from that surgery. Trust her to know, trust her to know that she's old and that that's not the way she wants to leave this world. But I did say to my grandma, Hey, Grandma, how about you go get a book by Dean Ornish? It's a great book. I said, it talks a lot about eating food a little different maybe than you've thought about. And also a little angry because nobody's ever talked to her. They put her on expensive medication. She makes $411 a month from her Social Security. That's it, from which she has to pay everything from. She has Medicare. And her cholesterol-lowering medication, an anti-plaque agent that was supposed to have worked, cost more than $120 a month. Nobody has ever, ever said one word to her about her diet. Not one word. Well, except her granddaughter, but, you know, I don't count. Um, <laughs> she went and got that Dean Ornish book, and you know what? This little old lady in Kansas, she is so excited. What is T-O-F-U? <laughs> Can I get that in Kansas? <laughs> you know what? Nutrition, so important. And garlic plays a part of that. And it's part of our history in Western medicine that we don't pay any attention to. Let thy food be thy medicine and thy medicine be thy food. Let me tell you, the food we eat today makes us sick. I don't know what we're expecting. We're going to have generations of people lined up for bypass surgery when Burger King is in the high school and when the, and when the elementary school sells soda pop so they earn money for the band. What is that? I, I, never mind. <laughs> what I'm saying to you, though, is that you're talking about a revolution, you're real, a peaceful revolution. But you're starting to say that food is important. And you're not ever going to get it in a pill. You know, I do think it's amusing that people buy ground-up broccoli and pay $30 a bottle for it. 
thinking somehow that they're going to get all the benefits you would have got if you would have just got a big old head of it and ate it. <laughs> Garlic, its benefits, physicians argue, it only reduces cholesterol by about 10%. Yeah, and? What else does it do besides reduce your cholesterol by 10%? It makes your platelets less likely to aggregate. Ooh, that's a bad thing. Well, then why are you giving everybody aspirin? It's not a bad thing. We want your platelets to be a little less sticky so you don't get a clot going somewhere that'll kill you. So garlic makes your platelets a little less sticky, drops your cholesterol, makes your blood pressure go down only a little, about 5 to 7%. And a four-year study in Germany shows that it actually reverses atherosclerotic plaque in your arteries. Garlic. Garlic? It's food. It's cheap. Eat it. Kenny mentioned uh, the late Dr. Viro Tyler, who um, was a true mentor to me, and I deeply um, am saddened by his passing. I remember we were up at a meeting, there was 20 of us all together. We were supposed to be evaluating the safety and efficacy of the 20 top herbs sold in the United States. <laughs> it was a rough day. It was really rough. I don't know where we got some of these people from on this panel, but we were, we were getting tired, and We'd, we'd, we'd gone around the circle, and now it was time to go over bilberry. Now, bilberry's European blueberry. And the woman who started it off said, well, I really don't think there's enough evidence to show that it does much. And more than that, I'm very concerned because there are not adequate safety studies done. <laughs> At which point, I did about lose it. I said, they're blueberries, for God's sake. It's blueberries. How much safety do you got to have to have a quarter cup of blueberries? My Lord. <laughs> Bilberries, blueberries, they are good for you. They are good for, and they're safe for you to eat. <laughs> you know, Interesting evidence looking at its effect in diabetic retinopathy. You know, the leading cause of blindness in the United States is from diabetes. Diabetes, diabetic retinopathy. Bilberries, these humble little fruits, actually have a very protective effect on the capillaries inside of the eyes. Now, this is important for me working in a community with many Hispanics and Native American individuals many who have diabetes, controlling their sugars, protecting their eyes, protecting their kidneys. Blueberries. Now, do I think you should take them all ground up, concentrated, and standardized in a pill? No, actually, I do not. I think you should go buy blueberries and eat them. <laughs> but this is also where we've come with the German model. And I did say that I greatly admire, and I do, I do admire that, but I tell you, it's also becoming the standardized reductionist drug model. And it takes us away again from simple living, eating organic foods, eating organic fruits and vegetables. Those are plants, folks. Seventy percent of your diet should be based on plants. Seventy percent whole grains, fruits, vegetables, Already, here at Bioneers, I was, I was listening to people just outside the speaker's room. Where can you get a hamburger? <laughs> you know who you are. <laughs> I'll send you Ornish's book, too. <laughs> I believe that plants have a role to play in promoting wellness. I believe that they can be used to treat many conditions. They use injectable IV forms of garlic to treat cryptococcal meningitis in China. Kind of amazing, don't you think? That stuff's powerful. I guess you got that I like garlic. <laughs> Echinacea. Echinacea, I'm such a fan of. I grew up on it. It was one of the most popular anti-infectives in the United States until 1920. It was the leading anti-infective agent. 
It was useful against strep and staph infections, but we know now that its prime effects, and what we knew then too, was that it made your body better able to fight off infection. Let me tell you something. We didn't survive a million years on this planet because we didn't get sick. Our bodies are strong. We're strong. Letting your body get sick once in a while is a good thing. Learning from illness is a powerful, powerful way to grow. I get parents that call me at home because I am in the phone book. <laughs> they always say, you're in the phone book at 1 o'clock in the morning. I'm like, that's right. <laughs> what you need. Okay. Johnny's got a 100-degree fever. Yes? Well, what should I do? Doesn't it, doesn't it tell us where we've come that we don't know what to do when Johnny's got a 100-degree fever? There are teas that have been used to help promote sweating. There have been teas that have been used to help the body fight off infection. And you know what? What I tell most moms and dads with Johnny at 1 o'clock in the morning, snuggle up, give them lots of kisses, Use a cool cloth if they feel warm. If they feel chilled, put a blanket on them. Their body's doing the right thing. If they become lethargic or something really changes and your instincts tell you there's really something wrong, you call me back and I'll come out and meet you. I'll meet you. I will leave my house, come and meet you. But I want you to use your instincts and I want you to do nothing. Do nothing. You know, sometimes it's okay to do nothing. Quit doing stuff. Quit giving women hormones when they get, go to menopause like we're diseased. My God, just let us be. I, that's my biggest beef if I had to leave here because we've been talking about women things, you know, and women's power. That's right. You know the most powerful women in the world are actually old crones. They're menopausal women. They're menopausal women who have a voice and have a powerful voice to send right now. And you know, we go in and we ask some 25-year-old man doctor, what should I do? <laughs> well, what the hell would he know about what you should do? <laughs> you take hormones or you don't take hormones. You decide, but just know that just menopause is like everything else in our life. It's a, it's a time for opportunity. It's a transition. It's a change. Illness is transformative. I am grateful for antibiotics. I'm grateful for emergency surgery. I'm grateful for all the gifts that Western medicine has brought, but it is not the only game in town, and it is not the best game in town for many of the problems that we're trying to deal with today. I started out saying that I'm hoping for the greening of medicine. And again, I, I just want to remind you that I think plants are symbolic for me of that. They're one piece of it. They're one part of it. But if we just look to herbs and just replace them without doing anything else, we've missed this opportunity to really change our lives for the better. Paradise comes from the Persian word for garden. The plants themselves are transformative. I never, ever had to drink an herb out of my garden to be healed, I could be healed by just sitting in it, by just resting amongst it, by smelling them, by being with them. Spirituality, if there's one thing we can bring in medicine, the dirty word we're not supposed to talk about, separation of religion and state somehow became separation of religion, spirit from medicine you got to bring the spirit back into medicine. That's what people are looking for. That's what people want. It's the feeling that we're all connected to something outside of and within ourselves. And to me, plants have just been one small method of reminding me of that. Joseph Campbell said that it is in the garden that wonders are revealed. And I'd say that that's true. That's one place that you can find it in the quiet. I want to thank all of you for just letting me come and hang out with you for a little bit. And uh, I didn't really have anything profound to say or anything you didn't already know. But I hope that it got us just thinking again and charging our juices that uh, 
we do have the power within us, just like the seed, to make change. Thank you. Thank you.